What is Protestantism? Well, Protestantism has a negative and a positive connotation. You cannot base a theology on a negative connotation. You have to base it on something positive. So the word Protestant means protestari, for the testament, for the word of God. And it also has a negative connotation to protest against something. So pro, in favor of, for, testari, so a pr true Protestant is a witness for the truth. And uh, it's not just simply the negation of error. So the true Protestant will bear primarily a positive message. I came not to judge the world, said Jesus, but to save the world. So it's based on scripture, it's based on a positive message of salvation, but there is also an element of protest. Now where does the protest come from? Well, it started way back with Augustine. He wrote a book called The City of God. And the theology of Augustine is really what caused the problem in the first place because he started to place the emphasis on the church as the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God wasn't something that was going to come sometime in the future. The kingdom of God was reigning in the church. So that sort of declared that Christ was reigning amongst his saints and that represented the kingdom. As a consequence, the church was then encouraged to assume the rulership of the nations and instead of carrying the gospel to the world, they became hung up on power and uh, rulership that they lost the gospel message. And political intrigue became the name of the game and the result was the Dark Ages. Now, by the time we reach the 12th century, we find that protest is beginning to develop. The Valdenses were the first ones to give a clear message that the church was not representing the gospel, but was, in a sense, antichrist. Joachim followed up with prophecies of Daniel, and it's interesting that he was one of the first to claim the day-year principle, so that the 1,260-day prophecy became 1,260 years. And then came the morning star of the Reformation, Wycliffe. And uh, Wycliffe came into conflict with the church when he started to expunge their errors and make it known that the church had to come back to a Bible-based gospel. Then followed Huss and Jerome, and of course we know that both of them were martyred at the stake. But they started using the information that Wycliffe had made available, and Wycliffe, not having any other manuscripts at his disposal, was the first one to translate the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into English. And this information started a hunger for the word of God and prepared the way for the later reformers such as Luther, Knox, Calvin, Baxter and Cranmer and all the other famous reformers that came after them. And they had an issue with the power mongering of the Church of Rome. So the Reformation rested on a twofold discovery. These are the twin pillars upon which the Reformation stands. And the first one is the rediscovery of Christ and his salvation as you find it in the Gospels. And the second one is the discovery of the identity of the Antichrist. The first one is the basis for the protestari, the testament of Christ, the Gospel message of the Bible. And the second one is the basis for the protest. So the discovery of the all-sufficiency of Christ rested on the Word of God. The Bible and the Bible alone became the watchword. They spoke about sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. Sola Christos, salvation in Christ and Christ alone. 
and sola fides. You are saved by faith and not by works. And the discovery of the identity of the Antichrist united the Reformation in opposition to a common enemy. So there were two aspects with the Reformation advance. Now if we go to the old history books, Grattan Guinness is a, a historian and a theologian of the Church of England, and he wrote a very famous book called Romanism and the Reformation, and it was published in 1887. So this is just more than 120 years ago. He published the view of the then-time Protestant church. And he writes that the Reformation of the 16th century, which gave birth to Protestantism, was based on Scripture. It gave back the world the Bible. It taught the Scriptures. It exposed the errors and the corruptions of Rome. And it taught the use of the sword of the Spirit. And then very importantly, it applied the prophecies and accepted their practical guidance. Such reformation work requires to be done afresh because we have suffered prophetic anti-papal truth to be too much forgotten. This was written in 1887. I wonder what this man would say if he were alive today. So we have to go back to the points on which scripture is tremendously decided and absolutely clear. So what did the reformers believe and why did they believe it? And the next question would be, why do we not believe it today? What has changed? Has the gospel changed? Has the Bible changed? Or have the views out there changed? Arthur Maxwell wrote, a man who thinks he can be a Protestant and yet reject the Bible or some portion of it is making a profound mistake. True Protestantism cannot only be anti-Catholic, it must also be anti-modernist, anti-evolutionist, and against everything that saps the church today. At the same time, it must be in favor of every good thing, prayer, Bible study. So you have to be positive. You cannot say sola scriptura and reject portions of the Bible. That doesn't make any sense. Either you believe the Bible or you do not believe the Bible. And if a Protestant says sola scriptura, then the Bible and the Bible alone. Sola Christos, Christ, is the only means of salvation. And sola fides, salvation is by faith. Now it's interesting that Martin Luther was particularly concerned about the book of Daniel. And he wrote the following in his Schriften. Therefore we bid all earnest Christians to read the book of Daniel to whom it will be a consolation and a great profit in these last miserable times. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is at hand. For the same reason we find in Daniel that the dreams and visions, how fearful they might be, end always in joy and gladness with the coming of Christ and his kingdom. Yea, for that chief article of faith, the coming of Christ, these visions were given, explained and recorded. Now, when Martin Luther translated the New Testament, he also had to translate the book of Revelation. And when he read the book of Revelation, it made no sense to him whatsoever. It sounded to him like someone who was inebriated had written this book of Revelation. And he thought that it, it shouldn't even be part of the Bible. And yet, when they discovered the prophecies of the book of Daniel, he became so excited about this book that it was the very first book that he translated from the Old Testament. Normally you would start with Genesis, but he started with the book of Daniel for the very reason that he gives right here. Every Christian must study this book of Daniel because the early reformers discovered that the key to the book of Revelation was to be found in the book of Daniel. And although he first rejected the book of Revelation, but translated it nevertheless, he certainly changed his view with time. Luther said, I hope that day is not far off and we shall still see it. So he had a, a, 
expectation for the coming of Christ. He wrote, I hope the last day will not tarry over a hundred years because God's word will be taken away again and a great darkness will come for the scarcity of ministers of the word. Now the irony of the matter is that the word of God is more prevalent today than at any other time in history. And yet I believe there is greater ignorance on the word of God than any other time in human history. Because people are misapplying the scriptures and counter-reformation ideologies have been coming in over time. Now if we take again a look at the historical books of, that of, the, of the Reformation, one of the greatest books on the Reformation is Abinier's History of the Reformation of the 16th century. It's a marvelous piece of work and it can be downloaded free from the internet. So I would suggest that everyone download it and store it because these books are becoming more and more impossible to get hold of. And he wrote, he writes, Martin Luther, Luther proved by the revelations of Daniel and St. John, by the epistles of Paul, Peter and Jude, that the reign of Antichrist predicted in and described in the Bible was the papacy. So this is what they believe. But today, this seems to have changed. So either the reformers were wrong or the present day theologians are wrong on the issue. And all the people did say, Amen, a holy terror seized their souls. It was Antichrist whom they beheld seated on the pontifical throne. This new idea which derived greater strength from the prophetic descriptions launched forth by Luther in the midst of his contemporaries inflicted the most terrible blow on Rome. So here was a discovery based on prophecy and not just one prophecy but Peter, Paul, Jude, John, Daniel, all of these together pointed to the same thing. And when that Bible translated by Martin Luther started rolling off the, the printing presses, it's astounding that the illustrations of the book of Revelation which he first contested were largely from that book. And here are a few examples. Here is the dragon spewing water to a woman, towards a woman standing on the moon with 12 stars around her head. And of course this comes from Revelation chapter 12 where the dragon, Satan, is spewing the water and the Bible defines the waters as the peoples, the multitudes, the nations towards the woman. So it's trying to destroy the gospel message, the church of Christ, by using the nations to destroy her and to persecute her. Another one that's fascinating is this one that also comes from Martin Luther's Bible, where you have the kings of the world bowing to a seven-headed beast, and a woman riding the beast. Of course, this comes from Revelation chapter 17. And uh, it's more than just a depiction of Revelation chapter 17 because it gives the Protestant interpretation. Because the woman who has the golden cup in her hand has a triple tiara on her head. So they are identifying her as the Church of Rome to which the kings of the world are paying homage. So, a little bit of their theology. Another illustration from Martin Luther's Bible is the contrast. Jesus Christ chasing the money changers out of the temple is the one picture, contrasted with the man with the triple crown upon his head, inviting them into the church. And then they put a little bit of theology in there by placing a hound, a dog, in the temple. Now if you know your scripture, the Bible says outside are the dogs. Because in scripture the dog is used as a symbol of paganism. So what they are saying by this illustration is that the papacy is the opposite of the kingdom of God and that paganism has been brought into the church. 
So they put their theology into what they wrote. Here's another interesting book, All Roads Lead to Rome, and the author says that there was a great cloud of witnesses. Wycliffe, Tyndall, Luther, Calvin, Cranmer. Cranmer was the first archbishop, Roman Catholic archbishop of Canterbury, who converted to Protestantism and was later martyred. And then in the 17th century, Bunyan and the translators of the King James Bible, and then also others like Sir Isaac Newton, Wesley, Whitfield, Spurgeon, all of these famous names, they were all agreed that the papacy was the Antichrist. Now, modern theology claims one of two theologies, preterism or futurism. Preterism, preterism teaches that the Antichrist came in the past, so is history, it's over and done with, and that he was a Greek king. And they have the name Antiochus Epiphanes IV because he persecuted the Jews and uh, did sacrilege to the temple by even offering pigs in the temple. So this was the Antichrist and his history. The great majority of the Christian world today believes in futurism. The Antichrist will come in the future. He'll come probably from an eastern tribe uh, associated maybe with the tribe of Dan. And he will sit in a literal temple which has to be rebuilt sometime in the future. And when his reign is over, then the Jews will all be converted. Prior to his coming, all Christians will be raptured away. So they're not even concerned with the Antichrist. So present-day Christians with both theologies, have nothing to do with the Antichrist. For the ones, he's in the past. For the others, he's sometime in the future. We'll deal only with the Jews and with any nation that is not converted to Christ, and the Christians will all be gone. So that's modern theology. But that's not what the Reformers believed. And we have to find out, is what they believed an error? Or is what today's world believes? An error. It's important. It's a matter of life and death. So let's have a look at what the reformers actually believe. If you go to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, there's a description of a statue that Nebuchadnezzar dreamt about that had a head of gold, arms of silver, and hips of bronze, and legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay, and Daniel gives the interpretation, these are the kingdoms as they will arise upon the earth, starting with the Babylonian kingdom, the head of gold, to be removed by the Medo-Persian kingdom, which would rule for a period only to be removed by the Greeks. So the Greece, Greece will rule the world, and then the Roman Empire, which eventually will break up into ten depicted by the feet of iron and clay. So that's a synopsis of what would happen upon the earth. And then Daniel himself had a dream, coloring in the picture and giving more details, but now not in terms of metals and a statue, but in terms of beasts. And he describes what a beast is. He says a beast is a kingdom that will arise upon the earth. And then he also speaks of horns. And horns, again, are kingdoms that will arise from these kingdoms. So beasts and horns represent kingdoms in the book of Daniel. And the first beast that he dreamt about was the lion with eagle wings. And that was, of course, also the symbol of, of Babylon. So they would know that he's speaking about Babylon, because this lion with wings would be on the Ishtar gate. They would see it when they walked into Babylon. It was the Babylonian symbol. Next would be a bear raised up on one side with three ribs in his mouth. That would then equate to the two arms of the Medo-Persians being raised up on one side. The Medes and the Persians were not equally yoked. And there were three wars that took place, or three battles, to conquer the Medo-Persian Empire. And then the four-headed beast would follow, the leopard beast. 
and it had four heads. And if we borrow a little bit from Daniel chapter 8, then we will see that the four, the number four, is there because when the Greek Empire, after Alexandra's death, was divided, it was divided into four. And then would come the terrible beast with ten horns. And that represents the legs of iron, so that's Rome. And the ten horns would be equivalent to the ten toes, which would be the divided Roman Empire after the collapse of pagan Rome. So the same kingdoms and the same sequence, but now added information. There's a little horn that appears in Daniel chapter 7 that arises amongst the ten. In other words, the post-pagan Rome powers when this power will arise. And we read about it in Daniel chapter 7 that he shall be different from the others. He shall be diverse from the first. So this little horn power is described in some detail. And the reformers, after studying the detail, came to the conclusion that this is the description of the Antichrist. So let's look at the attributes of this little horn power as they are given in Daniel chapter 7. And the first one is that it arises out of the fourth beast. Now the fourth beast is Rome. So it is a Roman power. Secondly, it arises amongst the ten horns. So we have a time frame when it will arise. After the Roman Empire had been divided into the European states. I considered the horns and beheld there came up among them another little horn. So the ten must have been there when this horn made its appearance. It arises after the ten horns. Another shall arise after them, verse 24. So if we look at the, the historic dates and we know when the Roman Empire fell, then it must be just after the fall when the Roman states were already there, the divided uh, barbarian states, and among them this power arises. And it is the one that is different from the others. He shall be diverse from the rest. Now he's a horn, so he must be a political entity, a kingdom, but he's different. So we'll see what the reformers did with that. And then he becomes more stout than the others, so he must be prescriptive. He must be a political entity that has clout, that becomes prescriptive because he's more stout. He is the boss man, as it were. Verse 20. The sixth point, three kingdoms are uprooted before him, before whom three fell. So there must be three of the original ten that are destroyed. And then in this horn are the eyes like a man, and he spoke great words against the Most High. So he must be involved in matters religion. It must be an ecclesiastical power as well because he speaks against God. In this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things against the Most High, verses 8 and verse 25. And then it would be a persecuting power because he would wear out the saints of the Most High. And then he would do something else. He will change times and laws. Well, which laws will he be concerned with? Every government that ever appears on this planet changes laws, so this cannot be just some secular law we're talking about. If he's speaking against the Most High, then he must also be involved with God's law. But God's law is unchangeable, but he thinks to change it. It is his will to change it. So he's a blasphemous power. And then he has some more attributes. The tenth one, he rules for a specific period of time. They shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and the dividing of times. Modern translations will put that at three and a half years. Now, when it comes to the modern ideology regarding the Antichrist, they claim he will come for three and a half literal years. 
and rule for that specific period. But that's not what the reformers believe, as we shall see. And then he will devour the whole earth. In other words, his influence will extend over the entire planet. The Bible says, The fourth beast, which shall be different, shall devour the whole earth and shall trample it and crush it. So it must have immense power at its disposal. And then it will exist until the end, until the Ancient of Days came, verse 22. Now here's a problem. If he makes his appearance amongst the ten, up Roots 3, we have an historic period sometime after the fall of pagan Rome and its division. And if he exists until the end of time, from that period until now, then the logical question to ask is, is he then here now or is he still coming? He must still be here because we haven't reached the end of time and we certainly have a time frame when he started. And also he cannot be a Greek king because then he would come out of which beast? The third one, which was Greece. So if he's not a if he comes out of the fourth one, he cannot be Greek. So that negates the theology of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And he cannot be future because he has to be right here according to this point. And then dominion is taken away at the end, but judgment shall sit and shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. So he will be judged and he will be destroyed when the judgment sits. This is when Christ returns. So the reformers were so convinced of their exegesis of this, of this prophecy and of what the other uh, apostles wrote on the issue that they were quite willing to put it in stone. So this is the Rathaus, the town hall of Nuremberg. And here above the portals of the entrances, they actually, in stone, depicted their theology. Well, here's a little bit of history. The Rathaus, or the town hall, with three magnificent Doric portals over which the prophetic beasts of Daniel 7 are carved. And these impressive fig figures, authorized by the city council, were sculptured by the well-known artist Leonard Kern, in 1617. Fascinating. So how long have they been hanging there? Virtually 400 years. For 400 years, they have witnessed to the reformers' ideology and understanding of prophecy. 400 years. That's a long time. Now let's see what they believed. Well, here's the one portal and you can see there are two beasts and two individuals next to them. And there's the other one with two further ones and uh, two individuals. Now let's go through them one by one. The first one, they have the lion with eagle wings and right next to them they place Nebuchadnezzar. So the reformers are sending a clear message that they believe that this lion Beast with the wings represented Babylon. If we look at the other beast, there's the bear with three ribs in its mouth, and next to it they place Cyrus the Great. So the reformers are saying this represents the Medes and the Persians. If we go to the other portal, there's the four-headed leopard beast, and right next to it they place Alexander the Great. So they're saying this represents Greece. And then, next to the terrible beast with the ten horns and another horn amongst the ten, they place Julius Caesar. So it's unequivocal. They are saying this represents Rome. And when it comes to the little horn power, they depict him with eyes and a mouth, as he is described in the Bible. Daniel 7 verse 8 says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up amongst them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn 
were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. And if we look at verse 25, it says he was speaking against the Most High. So the Reformer said that represents the Antichrist. Now, what were these three that were ripped up by the roots? Well, there were three powers that ruled in Rome that prevented the Church of Rome from assuming political power. So she was a church, a woman is a representation of the church. She was a woman, a church, but she was not a horn, because a horn represents political power. So when these three powers were eradicated, they were the Heruli, the Vandals and the Ostrogoths. The last power to rule was the Ostrogoths. They ruled over Rome. So the papacy could not assume political power. And then with the help of the Eastern Emperor, these three were eradicated. And in history it was recorded that they were of a different mindset, that they were Aryan rather than the Catholic view and understanding of the Godhead. And that's what the history books say. But of course, the history books are only to be seen through the lens of the theologians of the Church of Rome, because all the original writings were all destroyed. But nevertheless, three kingdoms had to be uprooted before Rome climbed onto not only the ecclesiastical chair, but on the political chair, and assumed the vacant position that the emperor used to have in Rome, and also appropriated to itself the title that was due to Caesar, namely Pontifex Maximus. And there's a date that we have for that event, which we, we will be looking at. Now, if you go to Europe today and you ask the modern Germans, what is this witness that has been standing there for 400 years? What is it testifying to? You will find amazing ignorance. So we took the trouble to ask many people what does this mean? We asked young people, we asked old people, we asked educated people, and not so educated people. And we'll give you a little smattering of what they said. So what does this mean? What does this beast represent? And what are those horns? And who are these figures of these people up there? And this is what they said. Yes. Do you know, do you have an idea what does it mean, these two sculptures? Oh. I don't know what it means. I really don't, don't know, know what it means. Of... What is this? Markus Lukas, Johannes Matthäus. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't read the Bible, Protestant. Yeah, that's the four. They are Protestants and Protestant. yeah, yeah. have the Bible not read? No, I haven't. Ach ja. Du? Interessant. Ich habe es gelesen, wie liest man nicht, wie bekennt man? Ich habe die Bibel gesehen. Die Bibel liest man nicht, die Bibel kennt man. Das ist ja kein Buch, was man liest, sondern am Ende weiß man, wie es ausgeht. Ja? <lacht> ah ja. Mhm. <lacht> Wissen Sie vielleicht die Bedeutung dieser Skulpturen, wenn Sie sich das anschauen? Oh, nein. No. Haben Sie eine Idee? Haben Sie eine Idee? Wissen Sie nicht, was das sein könnte? Was das darstellt? Nein, könnte man gar nicht vorstellen. Ja, schau mal. Was könnte denn das bedeuten? Die Kinder dürfen auch was sagen. Diese Figuren da oben und die Tiere im Hintergrund. Was könnte das für eine Bedeutung haben? Habt ihr in der Schule da schon mal was drüber gehört? Eigentlich doch. Doch gar nichts drüber gehört? Nee, im Geschichtsunterricht, im Religionsunterricht. Gar nichts gehört? Eigentlich nichts gehört? Mhm. Weißt du es, Papa? Ich weiß es grundsätzlich auch nicht. Ja. Sind Sie denn Nürnberger? Oder aus äh, der ich bin eigentlich, äh, ja, ich bin eigentlich Nürnberger. Wohne zwar mittlerweile in Fürth, aber ja. ich bin, ja. bin schon immer. Ja. Ich bin seit 1949 in Nürnberg. in Nürnberg. Was könnten denn die Skulpturen, die Figuren bedeuten hier am Rathaus von Nürnberg? Da muss ich Ihnen ganz ehrlich sagen, da habe ich mir so äh, das, äh, noch keine Gedanken darüber gemacht. Ich muss sagen, ich habe eigentlich noch nie hingeguckt. Ja. Aber irgendwie macht es mir den Eindruck, als ob das irgendwas Maritimes äh, Maritim? Ja. Nepp, 
Neptun. Neptun? Neptun. Also ich ja. bin jetzt wirklich überfragt. Ja. Ich muss ja. ganz ehrlich sagen. Ja. Ja. Es gab nie eine Aufklärung in der Volkshochschule zu Nürnberg oder nee, in den Schulen in Schule über das Rathaus wurde und seine, nee, ja, nee, wurde nicht sagen, gesprochen. Über, überhaupt ja. nicht. Also man, das, ist, das ist ein Lehrer aus Nürnberg. Das ist, Nürnberg. Aus Nürnberg. Das ist ein, Lehrer. ein Lehrer. Sie sind Lehrer aus ja. Nürnberg. Ein Lehrer. <lacht> Na, also Sie haben keine Idee, meine Herren? In der Schule was darüber gehört, Wolfscher bei der Stadtführung. Wolfscher Bau, jawohl, ja, erbaut. Ich habe bestimmt mal was darüber gehört. Eine Idee? Also, eine Idee, wenn es ein gutes Ding ist, müsste doch dort stehen irgendwo. Ne? Ja. 1600 selbiges Mal? Im 16. Jahrhundert, sagen wir mal so. Oh, dann ist es ja. falsch. Ja. Dann ist es ja. 1600 selbiges ja. Mal. Und was können wir die Figuren? Hat irgendeine Verbindung mit Venedig zu tun? Machen Sie mal weiter. Also, zwei Figuren, Wegen zwei Tiere im Hintergrund. Ist es der venezianische Löwe irgendwo? Da? Sie sind Lehrer. Welches Fach belegen Sie denn? Ich bin Geschichte Hauptschullehrer. Hauptschullehrer? Ja. Wird es in der Stadtführung, in Exkursionen hier aufgeklärt, was diese Bedeutungen sind? Am, am Wolfsonathaus wird das gemacht? Also ich habe es in der Uni damals gemacht, das ist schon ja. über 20 Jahre ja. her. Ne? Ja. Also von daher ja. Ja. weiß ich jetzt nicht so genau, ob das, ob das vorgekommen ja. ist. Ja, da fragen Sie mich natürlich jetzt, was? Ja. Da muss ich leider passen. Ja. Noch nie was drüber gehört nee. in den Exkursionen? Nee, mit, mit Sicherheit mal. Ja. Allerdings ja. geht es natürlich dann auch immer schnell wieder verloren. Ja, verstehe. Ne? Aber so in den Stadtführungen zu Nürnberg wird es nicht erwähnt, was die Bedeutung dieser Figuren am Rathaus ist. Zumindest jetzt nicht bei denen, ja. äh, die mir im Gedächtnis geblieben sind. Ja, ja. Und Sie sind konkret für die Lochgefängnisse Richtig. zuständig? Allerdings ja. nur als Absolut. Ja, ja. 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 Schauen Sie mal, sind Sie aus Nürnberg? Ja. Schauen Sie mal hier auf unser Rathaus. Diese Figuren, welche Bedeutung haben diese Figuren? Ja, wir können nicht alle sagen, das ist zum Teil der Reichsadler. Der Reichsadler? Rechts, äh, ist, äh, das ist das andere Wappen, aber nicht das Wappen der Stadt Nürnberg. Ja, ist nicht das ja. Wappen der Stadt Nürnberg? Aha. Ja. Und die Tiere und die Menschen, also diese Figuren oben, ich welche nicht, Bedeutung? Ich nicht so wissen genau. Sie nicht, wissen Sie nicht. Danke. Ich danke Ihnen sehr herzlich. Nobody knew. Nobody. Not the teachers, not the old people, not the young people. Nobody knew. Nobody had a clue even what it was. And the interesting thing is, the second last person was the trained guide for the town hall. We knocked on the door and asked for information and we got the guide who takes the people around and shows them the, the prison cells with the torture equipment that the the church used in the Middle Ages, and we asked him what it meant, and he didn't have a clue. Nobody has a clue. So perhaps people should look at this issue once again. Let's go back to Graton Guinness of uh, the Church of England, Romanism and the Reformation, and ask him what the Church of England believed 120 years ago. He writes, there are three distinct sets of prophecies of the rise of character, deeds, and doom of Romanism. The first is found in the book of Daniel, the second in the writings of Paul, and the third we find in the Apocalypse of John. And not one of these three is complete by itself. And then he explains, Daniel gives us the political character, Paul gives us the ecclesiastical character, and the Revelation gives us a combination of both. So he's looking at these three aspects. Daniel 7 verse 8, and there in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. So how does he explain this? Well this is what the church believed. The power symbolized by the proud, intelligent, blasphemous, head-like little horn of the Roman beast, to this it devotes on the contrary the greater part of the prophecy. And I must ask you now to carefully note the various points that prove, notice his terminology, that prove this horn to be a marvelous prophetic symbol or hieroglyph of the Roman papacy, fitting as one of Chubb's keys fits the lock for which it is made perfectly and in every part, while it refuses absolutely to adapt itself to any other. They were pretty sure of themselves, these early Church of England theologians, as to what they believed and why they believed it. And the question comes to mind, why do none of the modern day theologians of the same church believe what they believed in the beginning? 
He says, let's have a comparison. The place where it arises within the body of the Fourth Empire, so it must be Roman. The period of its origin, soon after the division of the Roman territory into ten kingdoms. This is him writing, not me. This is Church of England stuff. The nature, different from the other kingdoms, though in some respects like them. It was a horn, but with eyes and a mouth. It would be a kingdom like the rest, a monarchy, but its kings would be overseers or bishops and prophets. Its moral character, boastful, blasphemous, great words spoken against the Most High. Its lawlessness, it would claim authority over times and laws. Its opposition to the saints, it would be a persecuting power. And that for so long a period that he would wear out the saints of the Most High and be given into his hands for a time. And then listen to this, its duration, time, times and a half, or 1,260 years. Fascinating. So these reformers didn't believe in a literal time, as we find in modern theology, where the Antichrist will come for a literal three and a half years. They believed in the day-year prophecy time period. Now what's interesting about this period is that if you don't use it, then most of the prophecies in the Bible become nonsensical. So if there is a principle involved here, then that principle must be uniformly applied. For example, if you take the 70-week prophecy, which you find in Daniel chapter 9, it follows the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, and there you have specific time frames from the going forth of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, and then follows a very specific time prophecy. If you make it literal, it becomes useless. But if you apply the day-year principle, it works out exactly to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So it's very important that you apply the day-year principle or else prophecy becomes nonsensical and you can do anything with it, whatever you want. So the reformers applied the principle and came to the conclusion that the time, times and a half represents 1,260 years. Now, they were doing it with foresight. We have the advantage of doing it with hindsight. And if you look at this time period, it is a fascinating time period. Because the papacy as a horn power could only be established with the fall of the Ostrogoths, and that took place in 538 AD. Now if you add 1,260 years to that, you get to 1798. Now what happened in 1798? Napoleon ended the political power of Rome didn't lose its ecclesiastical power, but lost its political power. And the papal states were confiscated, and a secular government was established in Italy. So, from 538 to 1798, Rome ruled as a horn, as well as a, a woman, a church. So, for exactly 1,260 years, it exercised political power, and then it lost it. It's due. It would suffer the loss of its dominions before it was itself destroyed. They shall take away its dominion to consume and destroy it to the end. And then he writes, they all meet in the Roman papacy, the Latin language of the Caesar. It's the only church that has ever been named of their city. The papacy fulfills the first condition thereof during the time of the Ten Kingdoms were forming. The little horn grew up amongst the ten and the papacy developed synchronously with the Gothic kingdoms. So this was the reformer's thinking. Then he says, all right, that's Daniel's overview. Paul's, he says, consists of two parts. The first gives a general view of an apostasy, a great apostasy. And the second is a carefully drawn portrait of the power in which that apostasy would be headed up. And then he quotes scripture. Of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things. Now he's talking to the Christian church, Paul. So what is he saying? Will this be a pagan power or will it be a Christian power? 
must be a Christian power because he arises out of the ranks of Christianity, according to the prophecy. So futurism, which claims that it will be out of the ranks of Christendom, cannot be correct either. And then Paul says, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils will be taught, and speaking lies with hypocrisy, their conscience is seared, they will forbid to marry, and they will have prohibitions on food, and what you eat and what you don't, don't eat. And uh, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And then the theologian writes, here we have not only a prediction that there would be an apostasy or a falling away, but it gives you more information. The faith in the Christian church, but a description of its origin and character. The origin would be satanic, doctrines of devils. Its doctrines, demon doctrines. It would assume authority and lay down law and prohibitions. Amongst these, the prominent ones, would be a prohibition of marriage. Fascinating. Now, which church forbids its ecclesia, priests and nuns, etc., and monks, to marry? It's the Roman Catholic Church. So prominent amongst these was to be the prohibition of marriage. Marriage, although thus divinely ordained, would be prohibited. And meats, though created to be received with thanksgiving, the word meats there in the, in the Bible means foods, certain foods, would be forbidden. <clears throat> the substitution of an external religiousness and self-imposed sacrifices for true holiness of heart, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their consciences seared with a hot iron. Now, Rome is the one that introduced specific fast periods which are kept to this day. Lent, for example. So there were prohibitions on what you were to eat on certain days and other days, and fast times were prescribed. So exactly this describes what Rome actually did. This feature of false profession reappears in the corresponding prophecy in 2 Timothy concerning the last days in which the betters and adherents of the apostasy are described as having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So he writes, these men were then not open opponents to godliness, but on the contrary, they would be great professors. So this is a very deceptive way of going about the issue. And then he says, Paul doesn't give a specific duration. He only sets two limits. He writes, already the apostasy was developing and it would not be destroyed till the advent. Paul features of Antichrist chronology reveal when it would arise after the fall of Rome because he warned the early Christians that there was a power which was holding it back which had to be removed. Now, modern theologians will say, that was the Holy Spirit. How do you remove the Holy Spirit? So that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Whereas the early church fathers all proclaimed that the power that was holding us back was pagan Rome that was preventing it from seizing political power. So when pagan Rome is removed, then it will appear. And the apostasy was already developing in Paul's time, which was the time of Rome, not Greece. And Paul is speaking of it future, not past, so it cannot be Antiochus Epiphanes of the Greeks. Now it's amazing to me that some churches teach both theologies. Their, their theologians are trained in preterism, in other words, that the Antichrist was Antiochus, but because Futurism is the popular norm of today. They actually preach futurism to the congregation. Now, excuse me, how can the Antichrist be in the past and in the future at the same time? Very confusing. Paul says already it is developing. And it probably started developing with Simon Magus, who thought he could buy the Holy Spirit. So that apostasy was developing and it would not be destroyed until the advent. So Paul features of the Antichrist chronology reveal when it would arise after the fall of Rome and that it would exist to the second coming. 
and then it would be destroyed. So Paul has exactly the same time frame, although he doesn't give a prophetic profile as Daniel did. He sits in the temple of God. Now the modern theology is that when this Antichrist will appear after the, rap the, the rapture of the church, then he has to go and sit in a temple. And because the temple has been destroyed, obviously the temple must be rebuilt. That's the modern theology. Now what did the reformers believe? The face of the man of sin is the face of a false apostle, the dark face of a Judas, written upon the wall of the temple, son of perdition. The man of sin is a Judas, a secret enemy, because the word perdition, son of perdition, is used only twice in the Bible, once for Judas and once for the Antichrist. So they must have similar characteristics, and the, the reformers picked it up. So the man is a Judas, a secret enemy, while a seeming friend, a familiar friend, yet a fatal foe, who betrays with a kiss and a hail master. And observe the place occupied by the man of sin, the temple or the house of God. And the reformer said, this is not and cannot be any Jewish temple. That's the exact opposite of the modern theology. It cannot be. Now why did they say that? Well, they explain. Paul, who uses this expression in his prophetic portrait of Romanism, employs it both in Corinthians and Ephesians with reference to the Christian church. In the second epistle to the Corinthians, writing to the Gentile Christians, he says, Ye are the temple of the living God. And to the Ephesians, he says, You are a holy temple, a habitation of God through the Spirit. So to Paul, the church is the temple. So the temple of God was the church of Christ. And this is the temple in which his prophetic eye saw the man of sin seated. It is no person in a temple of stone, but a power in the Christian church. Now, this seems theologically a very sound argument. And modern theology has nothing to compare with this Bible-based theology. Now when they talk about his seat, observe the position of the man of sin. Notice the word he sitteth. I think these reformers really studied the word and came to conclusions based on Bible study and connected with a seat, a word which occurs three times in the New Testament. It is used twice with reference to the seats in the temple of those who sold doves and who turned the house of God into a house of merchandise and a den of thieves, and once for the sentence, quote, the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. And the word there in the Greek is katizo. And from this very word katizo comes the word cathedral, or the bishop's seat. And also the expression ex cathedra, when the Pope speaks infallibly. As when we so say the Pope speaks ex cathedra, or from his seat officially. There in this exalted cathedral position and claiming to represent God, the man of sin was to act and abide as the pretended vicar, but real antagonist of Christ, undermining his authority, abolishing his laws and oppressing his people. This is Church of England theology, 120 years ago. So then he compares Paul and Daniel. We don't have to read it all, just the salient point. Both of them say it's a Roman power. Paul says, already, and that was in the time of Rome, and he gives a time frame, when paganism, pagan Rome falls, it will come, and it will exist until the end of time, which is the same time frame that Daniel gives. So, they have the same chronological point of origin, both arise on the fall of the old undivided empire of Rome. So Daniel, and Paul are in harmony. Both exalt themselves against God. Daniel mentions the proud words and the blasphemous statements of the little horn, and Paul talks about his deeds and says he's the man of sin, showing himself to be divine, which is blasphemy. And both begin small and then become great, in conspicuous power, developing gradually, to have influence over the other, to become more stout. And both claim to be teachers of men. 
Daniel's little horn was to have eyes, as the eyes of a bishop or overseer. Meaning of the word bishop is overseer, and that he was to have a mouth. That is, he was to be a teacher, an ecclesiastical teacher. And Paul assigns him an ecclesiastical eminence, a proud position in God's church. And both are persecutors. Paul and Daniel agree on the issue. Daniel says the little horn is a persecuting power, wearing out the saints. And Paul speaks of the man of sin as opposing and calls himself the lawless one. So to sum up, he says they both have the same place, Rome, the same period from the 6th century to the second coming of Christ, the same character, the same wicked character, self-exaltation, they both grow gradually from weakness to power, and they both suffer the same doom, they will be destroyed. Paul says he will be destroyed by the brightness of the Lord's coming. So these resemblances are so important, so numerous, so comprehensive and exact, as to prove beyond all question that the self-exalting, persecuting power predicted by Daniel and this man of sin foretold by Paul are one and the same power. And he says even Romanists admit the case and they call the power that Paul speaks about Antichrist, but they don't apply it to themselves. So this is what the Reformers believed. Now, was it only the Church of England that believed this? No, all the Reformers believed it. And they all use the same scriptures and the same arguments. But let's make sure. Let's have a look at some of the Lutheran reformers. Now we're going back even further to when Luther and Melanchthon led the, the race in preaching this new found truth. Nicholas von Amstorf. Now Amstorf is a fascinating individual. And he was a personal friend of Martin Luther. Martin Luther says, My spirit finds rest in my dear Amstorf. Not only that, Amstorf is the one who writes the foreword on Table Talk. He was the one who gathered the information on this famous book, Table Talk, about Martin Luther's saying. He writes, He, the Antichrist, will be revealed and come to naught before the last day, so that every man shall comprehend and recognize that the Pope is the real, true Antichrist and not the Vicar of Christ. Pretty blatant statement. Therefore those who consider the Pope and the bishops as Christian shepherds and bishops are deeply in error. But even more are those who believe that the Turk is Antichrist. Now this is interesting, because today there are so many voices that say Islam is the Antichrist. Now, Islam existed in the time of the reformers. In fact, it was a great threat or perceived threat. And this is the opinion of the reformers. Why does he say the Turk cannot be Antichrist? Well, he says because the Turk rules outside of the church and does not sit in the holy place, nor does he seek to bear the name of Christ, but is an open antagonist of Christ in his church. This does not need to be revealed, but is clear and evident because he persecutes Christians openly and not as the Pope does, secretly under the form of godliness. So these people were logical. They thought this through. And if you read Martin Luther's saying on Islam, for example, it's absolutely abundantly clear that they made a clear distinction between Antichrist and Islam. Another one of the great Lutheran reformers was George Nigrinus, and he took up an argument with the Jesuits because the Jesuits were propagating a new theology, and it's the Jesuits who came up with preterism and futurism. So Alcazar and Ribera are the two Jesuits who came up with the idea that Antiochus was the Antichrist, or that it would be a future Antichrist who would ru rule for a literal three and a half years. So George Nigrinus took up an argument with the Jesuits, and he claims, the Jesuits claim to be sorely offended and have taken my declaration as an insult and blasphemy in branding the papacy as Antichrist, of which Daniel, Paul, Peter, John, and even Christ prophesied. But this is as true as that Jesus is the Messiah. So they were pretty convinced as to what they believed. And I'm prepared to show it even by their own definition of the word Antichrist. He says, this Jesuit 
further contends that the papacy cannot be Antichrist because the papacy has lasted for centuries, but that the Antichrist is supposed to reign only three and a half years. But no doubt, no one doubts today that Daniel spoke of year days and not literal days. The prophetic time periods of 42 months, 1,260 days, one, two and a half times are prophetic. And according to Ezekiel 4, a day must be taken for a year. So at best, he says, you can take Antiochus as a type, but certainly he's not the Antichrist. So we're talking about day years. This was Reformed theology. Another of the theologians, David Christus, also one of the Lutheran theologians, says the Lord himself revealed to Daniel how long the four world kingdoms would exist. And then he quotes Paul, the little horn, where we are told that it is the anti-Christian power, the papacy, would be fully revealed just before the judgment should take place. We know today that the four monarchies have long passed off the stage of action, and the two-horned beast, which is mentioned in Revelation 13, and which refers to the same power, cannot last much longer. And so we are forced to conclude that the day of judgment is not far hence. The same thought is given in Thessalonians, where the Roman Antichrist is again mentioned. Most of the other signs have also been fulfilled with our Savior, that our Savior referred to in Matthew 24. So all of these reformers, and if we take the Calvinists, well, the same thing. Some persons think us too severe when we call the Roman Pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself. And then he quotes Paul. So John Calvin believed that Rome was the Antichrist. John Knox, the one who brought the gospel to Scotland, he said that tyranny which the Pope himself has for so many ages exercised over the church. So he said he was the Antichrist, the son of perdition. Thomas Cranmer, the once time Catholic and then Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury, martyred for his faith, says, well, if it follows Rome to be the seat of Antichrist and the Pope to be the very Antichrist. And he says, I could prove it with Revelation and Daniel. Roger Williams, first Baptist pastor, says exactly the same thing. He sits in the temple of God and pretends to be God and he changes times and laws. And we don't have to go to one of the theologians of the Baptist Church. Let's have a look at what the whole Baptist Church said in its Baptist Confession. That the Pope of Rome is that man of sin, the son of perdition that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So that was the Baptist Confession. So it is astounding to me that the Baptist theologians today are visiting Rome and seeking re reunification with Rome when their own confession says what they used to believe. And what about the rest of the Christian world? Well, the Westminster Confession doesn't make any bones about it. There's no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be the head thereof, but is that Antichrist the man of sin the son of perdition that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. This was the Protestant position. And if we progress in history to the time of Wesley and the formation of the Methodist Church, then we find Wesley writes, he is talking about the papacy in an emphatical sense, the man of sin. He calls him the son of perdition and that he is being worshipped and claims a power that doesn't belong to him. All the reformers believed that. And probably one of the greatest preachers of all time, Charles Spurgeon, says it is the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist. But then he says, and as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise a question. If it is not the popery in the Church of Rome, there is nothing in the world that can be called by that name. It's either that or nothing. If there were to be an issue and a hue and cry for Antichrist, we would certainly take up this church with suspicion, and it would certainly not be let loose again, for it so exactly answers the description. I have news for Charles Spurgeon. He will be spinning in his grave 
because his church no longer believes what he taught. They've all returned in the ecumenical movement to join hands with Rome. He writes, Popery is contrary to Christ's gospel and it is antichrist. And then he gives the reasons why. It should be our daily prayer that he will be hurled into, like a millstone, into the flood and for Christ, because he wounds Christ, because he robs Christ of his glory. He puts a sacramental efficacy in the place of the atonement. He lifts a piece of bread in the place of the Saviour, a few drops of water in the place of the Holy Ghost, puts a fallible man like ourselves up as the vicar of Christ, and then he softens it and he says, if we pray against it, because it is against him, we shall love the persons, though we hate their errors. We shall love their souls, though we loathe and detest their dogmas. And so the breath of our prayer will be sweetened because we turn our faces towards Christ when we pray. The question we have to ask ourselves today, if what the reformers believed is biblical, if it's sound, exegetical view of what the Bible teaches, then what the theologians teach today must be error. And if it is error, why do people go along with it? Now, I want to take you to the Wartburg, where Martin Luther translated the New Testament. And of course, it was a Catholic enclave, and the whole state was Catholic. But it's been beautifully restored by none other than communist East Germany. And this is what it looked like. And uh, here are all the reliefs of St. Francis and St. Elizabeth and all of these. And when I was there a number of years ago, it happened to be the feast of St. Elizabeth, who was a Catholic saint living in the 8th century. And they had a concert there at the Wartburg. And, of course, the Wartburg is restored in all its Catholic glory with all the mosaics. And most of the mosaics in the Wartburg speak of this Catholic saint, Saint Elizabeth. So when the guide took us through, he spoke much of Saint Elizabeth. And uh, in, the, in the entrance portal where you pay for the tour, they have postcards with Saint Elizabeth and people bowing down before her. And then by contrast, they have Martin Luther the drunkard drinking beer. And the Pope, of course, initially called Martin Luther that drunken monk. But Martin Luther stopped drinking after he became converted to the Bible knowledge. So this is a very false presentation. So Martin Luther is depicted as the drunk and the saint as holy. And Martin Luther is here shown doing graffiti, spraying, here I spray and I can do no other, mocking his famous words, here I stand and can do no other, taking his stand upon the word of God. So today there is an atmosphere of irony and mocking regarding Martin Luther. But Elizabeth, the great saint, if you can touch the ring of Saint Elizabeth, and as this guide was taking us through the Wartburg. There were quite a number of people taking the tour. We were getting more and more irritated because all we heard was this great Elizabeth. And there was a man with me who had leather gear on and a crash helmet in his hand. So he obviously had biked to the place and he got very, very annoyed. And eventually he screamed at the guide and said, excuse me, I'm a Lutheran pastor, and I've come here to see where Martin Luther translated the Bible, not to hear about some saint. And the man remained perfectly calm and said, I'm terribly sorry, but uh, Martin Luther's rooms are not part of the tour. He said, excuse me, and he exploded. Now, I had judged him by his clothing, but when I heard that he was a Lutheran pastor and that he was now protesting, I joined him in the protest and said, uh, I've come also a long way from the other ends of the earth, from southern Africa, 
And I also want to see where Martin Luther translated the Bible. And he said, it's not part of the tour. You will not go there. And I said, well, we protest and we will make our protest public. Where's the office? We want to protest, which we then duly did. So we went to the office and knocked and said, we want to go where Martin Luther translated the Bible. He said, the place is locked. Just unlock it. And we want to make an official complaint that this is an entire Catholic uh, proceeding with only Catholic saints and no mention even of the Reformation except mocking it. And we want to protest. It is not right. If you show one, you must show the other. Otherwise, it's not fair. So eventually, they grudgingly went and uh, unlocked the door. Here's the door. And the lady is unlocking it. And we went inside, and this is what it looks like. A little replica of the desk that, where Martin Luther said, sat, it's exactly what it looks like, and what it looked like then. And here is a, a vertebra of a whale, and that's the original one that Martin Luther used as a footstool. But what struck me when I looked at this place was the simplicity. The contrast of the mosaics and the gold and the glitter surrounding the saints. And here, in this simple environment, the most precious gift that mankind could possibly receive was born. And uh, the door is locked. You're not supposed to go in there. And if you go to the other museums, they're pretty uh, poorly stocked in terms of the Reformation. So this is the Luther House in Eisenach. And here's another little museum where there's hardly anything on display. But the town is exactly as it was in the days of Luther. And what is also interesting, if you travel through the area, you will see that God, when he raised up the Reformation, didn't only correct the theology. He also corrected the style of worship because the great composers were also there. And uh, Haydn and Handel and Bach and all of these people added their talents. And for the first time again, instead of chanting to God in monotonous, repetitive ways, actual hymns of, of praise were created. And the Reformation stood on a firm foundation and Martin Luther penned that famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is our God. Eine feste Burg ist unser Gott. But where is that history and where is that information today? On the outside of the very church where Martin Luther preached, there is real graffiti. And some of it is pretty horrendous. It basically states that what is being taught inside here can be equated with vomit. And uh, that is where the Reformation stands today. People have no idea what the Reformers taught. They put it in stone and nobody knows what it says. Nobody knows what they believe. They contended with the Jesuits over theology and beat them at every level using scripture. And today everybody believes Jesuit theology and doesn't believe the Reformed theology. It is a sad state of affairs. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no one deceives you. If the modern theologians are wrong, then this must be one of the greatest deceptions that has ever been perpetrated upon man. And in the next lecture, we'll be looking at some of the most important issues that affect mankind today and choices that need to be made in order to determine whether we are with the fold of Jesus Christ or whether we are with another fold. May the Lord bless us as we contemplate these issues. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the reformers were crystal clear as to what they believed. 
Their faith was Bible-based, scripture-grounded. I pray that men and women today will again take the scriptures to hand and study what the reformers taught and to prove for themselves whether these things are so. Give us courage to live according to thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.